So today we have the S&P 500 reaching all-time highs. The other two major U.S. stock market indices, the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones Industrial Average, are also at or near all-time highs. And if you look at their long-term charts, they've basically gone up parabolic and at higher and higher bullish angles over the last couple years. I have uh, one of the charts in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group if you want to take a look, but the, the charts are just going up at steeper and steeper angles, which in the short term might be bullish, but it is extremely worrisome because there is a lot of indicators that we could be near a top. We had Barron's Magazine recently release on their April cover, is the bull, un is the bull market unstoppable? So magazine covers are often contrarian indicators for tops. It is very difficult to pick a stock market top, but these magazine covers often, they don't predict the top immediately, but in the near future. Because remember in 2011, we had, after, when gold was at $1,900 an ounce in US dollars, we had Barron's and all the mainstream media, mainstream financial media magazines talking about gold, talking about gold miners, saying is gold going a lot higher than 1900 and gold topped with manipulation and other rules changes on the COMEX and LBMA, etc. We had gold top. Same thing with Bitcoin about a year and a half ago at the end of what, 2017, early 2018, when Bitcoin topped around 1900, uh, 19,000. So the magazine covers for contrarian indicators, what the magazine covers for contrarian indicators are often signs of the time. So I would monitor that right now. I think the major claim is Barron's, but I think there may be one or two other magazine covers out there. Let me provide you some additional details though on how it is not all the stocks in the S&P 500 that are moving that are healthy. That are that are making new new highs. So here, let me provide this is a tweet from the guy from Hedge Fund Telemetry. He's a hedge fund researcher. He has an expensive newsletter, but he put this out on his Twitter. Okay, so all-time highs in quotes for the S&P 500. Only 45 out of 500 stocks are hitting 52-week highs. For the NASDAQ index, only 13 out of 100 are hitting new 52-week highs. The mid-cap 400 has only 24 out of 400 at new 52-week highs. And the Russell 2000 small cap has only... 55 out of 2,000 stocks hitting 52-week highs. The Russell 3000 has only 138 out of 3,000 hitting 52-week highs. So the way I would look at this is it's talked about breadth, market breadth. We do not have a large breadth of stocks moving in unison the indices higher with higher revenue growth, higher earnings growth, um, maintaining margins or increasing margins and increasing free cash flow. That is not the case. Okay, and to add further examples, let's talk about Apple because, you know, Apple, every, everyone's very familiar with the company. Well, Apple, uh, I don't know if they announced earnings for Q1 2019 yet, but their last quarter for Q4 2018, they announced that they missed sales by, what, $9 billion and they announced weaker guidance. And guess what? The stock price is up 40%, around 40% since that bad news. Okay, that's how crazy, dystopian, bizarro world, Twilight Zone, Black Mirror things are. We're at it, and this is why we're in an environment now where old-time money managers, people with value investors, people who had a long-term track record, who have been managing money for many, many years, they can't figure things out because in the past, when a company missed that badly, no one bought the dip. Things were bad for a long time, okay? And so in the new normal, the crazy and getting even more crazier new normal we're in, where there's flight capital coming into the U.S., constant liquidity injections from government, from central banks that we may or may not have any idea about. And this is why, um, combined with high-frequency trading algorithms and the, the stupid passive investing index fund bubble, that people are buying Apple stock on the dip when the fundamentals were getting worse. So this is a new normal now, and it is very, very weird. And this is why money managers in the past, the rules that they stuck to, the common sense rules for money managing and investing that they made a lot of money on, that it is not working for them now. 
because you have high frequency trading algorithms, because you have central banks doing hidden, either covert or overt liquidity injections or QE program, backdoor bailouts, you have governments and politicians and bureaucrats constantly doing rules changes. There's stuff going on behind the scenes. You have CEOs blatantly lying, whether it's Elon Musk at Tesla or the newest scandal that I just saw recently was Wall Street Journal reported on this. And there's an excellent article on Seeking Alpha, Alpha, excuse me, Seeking Alpha from Josh Young. He's an energy hedge fund manager. And he was talking about how the CEOs and upper uh, senior executives at Anadarko Petroleum screwed over their shareholders and they sold out to Chevron for a lot less money than Occidental Petroleum offered, even though Occidental, Occidental Petroleum has increased their offer, I think, three times. And that is because, and the Wall Street Journal reported this, a day before the CEO and the senior management at Anadarko accepted the offer from Chevron, they changed their compensation package. So they got, they probably negotiated with Chevron so they would get all these extra stock options triggered. So the executives at Anadarko Petroleum, even though they're selling out their shareholders, even though they haven't produced returns for their shareholders lately, they are cashing out an extra $22 million plus tax benefits to sell out the company for cheaper than the best offer. We are in just crazy, crazy pills territory. And the latest earnings bomb was 3M, but there's a bunch of others, but 3M was a main one. So let me just talk about 3M. So 3M dropped 13% in a single day. The volume swelled to 14.5 million shares compared with the full day average of only about 1.9 million shares. And it was by far the biggest decliner in the Dow. And I think this was the largest percentage decline second only to the 26% plunge on Black Tuesday in 1987, October 19th, 1987, uh, Black Monday, excuse me. So 3M, uh, let me go into the fundamentals now. I have this other, I have three articles here opened up about 3M. I'll attach them all in the information section of the show after they're done if you want to go in depth. But most people, when they think of 3M, they think of like scotch tape, duct tape, post-it notes. Um, the 3M company is Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, and they actually own and manufacture and produce a lot of different products throughout the global economy. So they're a pretty interesting, I would say a pretty interesting like leading economic indicator, similar to like the chemicals companies. If you saw the Real Vision television interview from the guy about eight months ago or a year ago, they had a chemicals expert guy and he said the chemicals companies, because they're involved in so many different businesses, that the chemicals companies are a true leading economic indica indicator. So I would say 3M is probably a leading economic indicator too, because they are involved in so producing products for so many different industries. So the company produces a variety of products, including adhesives, abrasives, laminates, pacifier protection, personal protective equipment, window films, paint protection films, dental and orthodontic products, electronic materials, medical products, car care products, electronic circuits, healthcare software, and optical for films. So they are extremely diversified throughout the entire economy. And what worried the market the most is their worst declines in revenue came in, in its manufacturing for industry and for electronics and, and, and energy, where revenue was down 6.6% and 11.9% respectively. So a big drop in revenue. And with these large older companies, and we had a listener question about Kraft and, or Mondelez or Cadbury. I can't remember because there's been so many mergers and spinoffs and financial engineering, but these businesses like 3M and those others, they do generate a lot of cash flow. They do have a lot of market share. They do have a pretty wide moat. At least they have somewhat of a brand on some of their products. The problem with these businesses that the senior management teams have been doing now for at least a decade is the financial engineering. So the businesses itself are normally 
really good Warren Buffett type of um, moat consumer monopoly businesses to use Buffettology book for a guide because remember all businesses fit into only four categories. These businesses are low profit margin but very high turnover meaning they get tons of sales but they don't necessarily make a lot of money off each, each widget or good that they sell or service that they sell. And the main problem with these businesses is because the senior management team to get rich quick and keep earnings higher, they have loaded the balance sheets with debt. So they have either done too many leverage buyouts, mergers and acquisition with debt, or they have done too much share buybacks with debt to boost earnings because they can't grow revenues. And the companies get in trouble when their revenues unexpectedly fall and they cannot handle the debt load. So I haven't looked at Kraft in detail or, or the other businesses, two other b main businesses, because they've been rebranding these things to like Mondelez and they bought Cadbury, I think, a couple, quite a few years ago, five years ago, something like that in another multi-billion dollar leverage buyout. But in general about these large corporations, they do have good businesses with cash flow. The main problem though is they've the management teams have leveraged these things to the hilt, betting that they will not lose their revenues. And if the revenues fall, the company has immense, immense problems with debt. Meaning that there's gonna they're gonna have to sell assets to pay off debt, they're gonna have to dilute shareholders to pay off debt, or God forbid, you know, there's a bankruptcy type of situation or restructuring. So, like I said, for Buffetology, I didn't go. I re-listened to that interview. I forgot to mention all four categories, but I recommend reading the book if you want to learn about business and value investing. There's high profit, high high profit margin, high turnover businesses. Those businesses are rare. There's very few. Most of them are normally not on a on a publicly traded exchange. The only high profit, high turnover, high sales businesses I know with super super high consistent margins are the precious metals royalty and streaming companies. They are extremely rare businesses to be listed on a publicly traded exchange. Warren Buffett looks for those businesses. Normally, Warren Buffett only finds the low profit margin, high turnover businesses with either consumer monopolies or economic moats or durable competitive advantages that have invested into marketing and a brand. So like a low profit margin, high turnover business, I use Chipotle as an example. Kraft or Mondelez would be another example. They don't necessarily make a lot of money with their, their food uh, on each of their food items that they sell, but they sell millions and millions and millions of them. And they have millions and millions and millions of customers. And they've invested a lot in marketing to protect their brand. And then if consumer preferences change, because God knows they don't make the healthiest food, they can just either rebrand re and innovate and have new healthier products or they can go do an acquisition which and this is how these companies maintain market share you've seen this with Budweiser going and buying the craft beer companies the problem is these companies have used way too much debt to maintain market share and to do financial engineering for share buybacks and all these other things okay so I hopefully answered that enough I haven't looked at craft in detail the listener who asked that on the last live stream show, but I would suspect the last time I did look at them, they had way too much debt for my liking. Their their le uh, ca debt to cash flow ratios and debt to equity ratios were not that good, and I, I'm sure they've gotten worse because um, of the news that's come out in the last couple months from Kraft. So if I could summarize the macro situation, we've had bad news over the last over the last four to six months. Very dire warnings about. China and the European Union from FedEx, Apple has had problems. The, chip, the silicone chip manufacturers have, have had big cuts in sales. The Baltic Dry Shipping Index is bad. The South Korean Shipping Index is bad. Taiwan Container Shipping is bad. Now 3M. And in addition to that, we also have really bad German PMI manufacturing numbers and Japan PMI manufacturing numbers. I believe these are the worst ones in about six years since around 2012 six, seven years. So about 2012-ish. Some of them are worse than that. Uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth was on a panel that was recorded for Real Vision TV about a month ago. And she was talking about the auto industry and how bad things are here in the US and how there's really high inventory levels and sales are falling too. And how Germany is getting hit because they produce more cars. I think they produce double the amount of cars than any other country, but things are bad in the U.S. and then Trump's throwing a temper tantrum that he doesn't want the auto companies cutting jobs. And you're seeing a massive amount of unemployment claims where there's more car factories because sales are declining.
Hello, program. Uh, I would I would watch the new Kyle Bass interview. It's for free on Hedge ITV. It just got released yesterday. Keith McCullough, I just finished it up before I turned on the live stream. It is really good for an hour, and I don't think China is going to be able to do the stimulus packages or QE you think anymore. Basically, he said that China is almost entirely out of dollars to buy commodities and oil and stuff. He said China China has been manipulating their currency higher. Normally what countries do is they manipulate their currencies lower. There's intervention on the foreign exchange market to manipulate exchange, exchange rates lower. But China has been propping up their currency to prevent it from crashing. He thinks 50 to 60% manipulation higher to prevent it from crashing. I would, I would definitely take a look at that because there were questions submitted by money managers and hedge fund managers saying Keith McCullough is one of the best global macro thinkers along with Kyle Bass, and I think that's worth your time. There's all uh, if, if you're in the Wall Street for Mean Street Facebook group, it's also linked in there. There's also a, a very interesting speech that Kyle Bass gave in the last couple of weeks at a U.S. national security conference warning about Hong Kong, all the problems, how China has done a lot of its financial um they've moved a lot of their goods to hong kong and reshipped them out of there so chinese goods wouldn't get hit with tariffs and other games and then all the financialization in hong kong with their banks and their real estate bubble and stuff like that sounds like and hong kong is they've spent he said over 80 percent of their reserves defending their dollar peg in just the last like couple of years so hong kong has blown through almost all of their reserves defending their dollar peg so it sounds like Hong Kong is in deep, deep trouble. Um, you can look it up on the Hedgeye YouTube channel. The Hedgeye YouTube channel. It's free. They just released the Kyle Bass interview. It's an, it's an hour long. It's really good. I just watched it before the show. Okay, checking my notes. So Iran, Trump just... Trump is claiming that he wants to lower the Iran with sanctions and tariffs and stuff. The, I don't know about tariffs, but sanctions. The Iran oil exports with a banner embargo down to almost zero. Why? Well, the U.S. has done this before. The U.S. did this when the Shah was falling out of favor. And normally it's pressure from the Saudis or pressure from Israel. But in this case, there may be, it may be a combination of factors. So not only has the U.S. labeled um, the Iranian national, the Iranian Guard, a terrorist organization, but also the U.S. I think wants slightly higher oil prices because I think Trump's been told how bad things are for the U.S. shale oil producers. So Trump does want lower gasoline prices, but then he's also been told that hey, if we knock the oil price down further, the shale guys are going to go bust. They cannot raise the capital anymore. And you know what? The capex that is needed for shale is even higher than it was in the past. So those profits that the shale CEOs were promising, the, that free cash flow, it never came. If you go back and look at the conference calls, the transcripts, a lot of these shale CEOs have been promising profitability every year for 10 or 11 years, and it's never come. And finally, financiers and Wall Street have woken up. And they're just not getting the capital. So a lower cost shale producer like EOG could probably raise money now because they're lowest cost and they're most respected and they run a very tight ship in terms of efficiency. But some of these other guys, it sounds like they're going to either go bankruptcy restructuring or they're going to have to sell the assets out for pennies on the dollar to a, a larger oil major. Not that the larger oil majors are being run that well either. So I think one thing I've learned about the oil market now that I've I had a day job there and I've interviewed a lot of experts and read oil books is that the oil market is extremely political. There's a lot of manipulation, whether it's the Saudis in there trying to bankrupt shale that failed. They did try, though. They tried to bankrupt shale. The Saudis had the oil experts come present to them what the production costs were for the shale producers, and they tried to blow through on the oil price and knock it down to bankrupt the shale guys, but the shale guys lowered their costs enough and were able to raise enough capital with debt and equity to offset the manipulation the Saudis tried to do from like 2013 to 2016-17. 
So there's the oil market is an extremely manipulated market. Trump has tweeted out many times in the past he wants that he's influenced Saudi to maintain or increase production levels. He wants lower gas prices. But the problem now is if the oil price gets too high, it's a problem. If the oil price gets too low, it's also a problem. And the oil price was getting too low a couple months ago. It was getting so low that there was going to be no investment into oil and the shale oil producers could not raise capital. But if you have a higher oil price, a slightly higher oil price at the prices we are now or maybe a little bit higher, I suspect that the shale oil guys or at least the larger oil companies might be interested in coming in now and making acquisitions of that sh those shale assets and making the investments that way. So if the shale guys cannot raise capital, debt and equity like they were able to in the past, when people were thinking more long term about returns, then the larger oil companies could step in and fill that void. Because from what it sounds like, the appetite for whether it's pension funds, mutual funds, and private equity guys to buy shale oil equity and debt is just not there. And uh, as far as I know, the private equity guys, a lot of them are still trapped with many billions that they can't offload. So if the, if the oil market uh, either stays at these levels or goes a bit higher, I think it would be easier for, for the shale producers to raise capital and for the private equity guys to dump it, um, to hot potato and dump it on someone else. Um, actually, the refiners, the higher the oil price goes, normally the refiners don't do well. The refiners actually benefit from lower oil prices so it would depend um at these oil prices the deep water offshore drilling rig guys does not financial advice just my opinion at of uh, there was a really good article that i put in the information section of bloomberg one talking about capex spending and it looks like the deep water offshore oil driller companies like transocean diamond offshore there's a, a couple of others let me take a look um Okay, let me, I'm going to Seeking Alpha, and I have it in my, saved in my watch list. The, okay, one of them is ESV, Eric, Sam, Victor, and that is Ensco Rowan, E-N-S-C-O-R-O-W-A-N. Another one is uh, tech, uh, FTI, Frank, Tommy, Israel. And that is the company's name is Technip FMC. They make deep water uh, equipment. So there's like a handful of these companies that are going to start to get more contracts to either build new rigs or leasing out rigs and the rigs might go up. But it's looking like the return on investment for CapEx is now better for deep water offshore drilling relative to shale. The refiners, though, normally do not do well when the oil prices start to rise. This is so this time may be different, but historically, normally the refiners do not do well when oil prices rise. They do well when oil prices crash and stay low for a while. I went back and did some research um, for a listener who was saying how he thinks India is going to be better than China. I'm telling you that there's just too much corruption and bureaucracy and central planning and there's still from the government a lot of socialism there and they just don't have they've just wasted way too much money their banks have had many rounds of bailouts their latest round of indian bank bailouts which i don't i don't know if the alternative media covered at all but i saw i found a number of articles from the mainstream financial media from 2017 to 2018 talking about over 35 billion dollars worth of bank bailouts for indian banks and saying how it wasn't enough and they had to do even more and there's been rounds every i don't know seven to ten years of indian bank bailouts so there's been a lot of problems with that um you got the you got the you got the ticker symbol wrong it's esv that's the new one. That's they just there was a large merger and that's the new largest uh deep water offshore drilling company that leases out the rigs. The other one's Sea Drill, but that just But that just came out of bankruptcy and Sea Drill has way too much debt. I would stay away from Sea Drill. I talked about Sea Drill about 6 months ago and 
the the creditors and bankers really did the um Cedro used to be owned by one of the richest men in Europe it was this rich Norwegian billionaire and it went bankrupt because they were way too leveraged they had a dividend payout ratio of 400 when i was a um my day job at investing daily as an oil and energy analyst in 2013 there were idiots that were telling me who were my bosses telling me to write positive articles about um for newsletters about cedral as a dividend stock and it had a 400 percent dividend payout ratio and its debt to equity ratio and debt to cash flow ratio were insane when uh, if you're not familiar with what a uh, a dividend payout ratio is if it's if it's anywhere near a hundred percent meaning that you're paying out a hundred percent of earnings or larger it means that basically to smooth things out you're using debt to pay your dividend and it is a big or you're using cash on hand and it is a big big red flag and it was for the debt the dividend payout ratio for cedral got as high as 400 percent so it was an enormous red flag and I was looking at the company and I was like, Jesus, this is a piece of garbage. I can't believe the company I work for is recommending this. But, you know, like I was I was hired and I had to work. I was at the bottom of the ladder. So if I spoke out and said stuff like that, if I wasn't polite, that's not how things worked over there. So if you didn't speak out politely, if you didn't speak up politely, you get fired for questioning people like that, even though it was the right thing to do. But that's just the problems with the newsletter industry in general. I hear the same thing from friends who have worked at uh, all, uh, larger paid newsletter companies too. Okay, I'm taking a look at my notes. I think I've covered pretty much everything. Yeah, so things things just keep getting crazier. This is not a wide widely participated bull market it is not every stock that's going up in fact most stocks when they report revenues earnings margins free cash flow things are not doing well across the board you have exceptions to that obviously but in general most companies are not doing well right now and the global macro data is getting worse and the companies reporting revenues earnings things like that most of them are not good and yet the stock market is where it is now. <laughs> it's a it's a combination of factors of flight capital from all these other liquidity programs and QE programs coming here to the U.S. So when these other central banks do QE programs and liquidity injections, the economic and political elites in those other countries they don't want. They know that hey, how, why did I just able to borrow this money cheaply? Oh, I'm going to move the money out of the country. I don't trust this other country. Okay, no spoilers in the comment section about the Avengers movie. I have tickets to it in about three hours. No spoilers. Oh, I uh, wanted to talk about a couple more things. I highly, like I said, I highly recommend the Kyle Bass interview that Keith McCullough did. There's some really great insights in there about China's manipulating their currency up, not down, surprisingly, and how China is, needs a lot of dollars to buy commodities like food, copper, energy, uh, other metals, etc., and they're running out of dollars. The dollar index, either yesterday or the day before, it did get above 98. It is at 97.93, and in spite of that, gold and silver actually holding up pretty good. Gold did not crash despite this dollar rally, but the, the higher the dollar index goes, the more pain it will cause because a lot of countries, whether it's their banks, their corporations, their foreign governments have way over borrowed in dollars. The gold price is at 1289.70, silver is back over 15. You know, this, this to me looks like a sideways market still for gold and silver. With the manipulation and the other stuff, I mean, everyone's heard about the COMEX stories if you're, you've been involved in the gold and silver market for a while. And to me, the beneficiaries of this part of the cycle are the royal, the five largest royalty and streaming companies because they just adapt to the types of deals they do. There's not going to be a lot of companies that are going to uh, mining companies that are going to bring on new mines. And in this environment, if we if this continues to go sideways with volatility, the prices for a little while longer, another year or two, some of the miners are going to need to do deals with the royalty and streaming companies to fix their balance sheets. Which 
means opportune. Their cost of capital for the royalty and streaming companies, the larger ones, is much, much cheaper than mining companies. There are a lot of mining companies now that are junk or worse on junk debt. There was, I think, the, the one of the worst examples that I've seen lately of a mining company that seems to be really struggling is the uh, Victoria Gold, the Eagle Mine. I think that those shares are down enormously. They've been trying to bring online a very high capex, uh, lo very low grade open pit gold mine in the Yukon, and that does not look good. It looks real bad. Uh, Osisco Gold Royalty, which in general is a pretty good company, that looks like a really bad deal for Osisco. I think they put over ninety million dollars into that deal. I would, and not only do they have a, a stream on it, I think they also own a lot of shares of Victoria Gold. I wouldn't be surprised if everything's written off. That deal does not look good. And yet, I know uh, pretty well-respected gold and silver newsletter writers that were recommending that uh, Victoria Gold. Ooh. See, a lot of things can go wrong in a mine, guys. You do in in this environment, you do not want to have to. If you're a mining company, you do not want to have to ch to, to chap. Uh, excuse me, to chap. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. To tap the junk bond markets at bad interest rates. You do not want to have to sell equity when your share price is down 70, 80, 90%. You do not want to have to do that. That is stuff that desperate companies do. You do not want to have to do what Yamana Gold just did and sell Chipata, which was their lowest cost, highest margin producing mine for cash to pay off debt. You don't want to have to do that either. Okay, D's nuts, I can't read that out loud. <laughs> so yes, the global economy, everything appears to be getting a lot worse. China, the things are much worse than China claims. And the earnings reports so far for the, uh, the Q1 2019 are bad. But the stock market doesn't seem to care about that as long as there's the hint of more quantitative easing coming. And, you know, despite this supposedly greatest economy of all time, according to President Trump, Larry Kudlow, and all these other people, they're already talking about implementing 50 basis points and rate cuts immediately. Oh, and there was just really interesting comments from Kyle Bass in the Hedge ITV interview about he had a meeting with one of Nancy Pelosi's top advisors, and apparently there's no way the Democrats are willing to do any type of in infrastructure deal with Trump. No matter what types of proposals Trump tries, the Democrats do not want to give him a win. The Democrats are hoping that the stock market and economy will totally crash before the 2020 election, according to conversations that Kyle Bass said he had with uh, a top advisor, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi used an analogy. She said Trump has taken the economy hostage, and she says she's going to let the hostage get shot in the head, which to me means the Democrats are going to do nothing, and they are going to let this thing blow up and then try to blame it on Trump and take back as many seats in the next congressional election as they can, and then uh, blame Trump when things blow up. So if Trump turns into maybe Herbert Hoover... I think he is turning into Herbert Hoover, but if, if there is an October 1929 Black Tuesday stock market crash, then he definitely will be Herbert Hoover. Hello, Bill. I think as of now, Trump will get reelected, but that's just because of how bad all the Democrat candidates are, and they can't stop themselves from saying crazier and crazier things. The, the levels of craziness and stupidity and socialism and just you know the racist and sexist things that some of these democrats are saying and doing is just freaking nuts and they're supposed to be the party of tolerance you know they're they're the worst kind of hypocrites and double standard but i think the democrats will destroy the the candidates will destroy each other there's just too many of them they're gonna be putting out tons of dirt the person who's ahead in the polls joe biden he is Oh my God, that the stories about his sexual harassment, I don't know why they haven't come out yet in the mainstream media because they are literally, they've been in books for years. There's an author named Ronald Kessler. He wrote two books about the Secret Service, um, the Secret Service, interviewing Secret Service agents of vice presidents and first families and presidents. And there's just crazy stories in there. You know, one of the stories was about 
Joe Biden swimming naked, but there's even worse stories than that. He's a he's a big time, big time sexual sexual harasser. Like he's one of the worst offenders in Me Too. He's like an he's a serial ass grabber, and he would be he would routinely like answer the door for his female Secret Service agents drunk and naked, and just harass them. And he he got so ba he was harassing one of the female Secret Service agents so bad, and his dumb drunk ass didn't know that the boyfriend the the woman's boyfriend was a male Secret Service agent also there, and he harassed her in front of the boyfriend, and he got in a fist fight and got his ass beat. And after that incident, when uh, Joe Biden got in a fist fight and got his ass kicked, there were no more female Secret Service agents allowed on his detail. But you don't hear any of that brought up in the mainstream media. I'm No one in Fox News is even willing to talk about it. There was only a tiny little excerpt from one of Ronald Kessler's books. Meanwhile, I've listened to interviews years ago because Kerry Lutz had him on a podcast years ago to promote his books, saying that how good they were. And he was going into greater detail about the stories about Joe Biden. Oh, I just saw also like an old news footage because Biden tried to run for president in the late 1980s. And back then, the mainstream media wasn't as biased and was more honest compared to now. And the the probably Democrat or somewhat Republican mainstream media, they actually called out Joe Biden on lies. And they caught him in such bad lies, like about his law school grades and other lies, that he had to drop out of the presidential race in the late 80s. And, you know, society has devolved morally so much more, more moral bankruptcy now that no one is even talking about that anymore. So this man already had to drop out of a presidential election 30 years ago, approximately, because he was lying, couldn't tell the truth, dishonest, lying about his resume, and now here he is again leading the polls. Welcome to dystopia, right? And the economic cartoon I have, and this is interesting, we have all of these corporate CEOs trying to lower the bar with the analysts, the stock analysts and investment bank analysts covering their shares. So if the company knows that the, the, the number is going to be bad for revenues or earnings, they talk the bar down so they can beat it by a penny. And the average person doesn't know this. And the stupid high-frequency trading algorithms are only programmed to bid the stock price up higher if it beats. So if the bar's lowered, the high-frequency trading algorithms don't adapt to it. They don't adapt to this change. So if the projections for revenues and earnings were lowered, say 50 or 60%, the high frequency trading alg algorithms don't care that the projections were lowered. They only care if there's a beat by a penny, even if the bar was lowered a lot. And so that's why you have people like Elon Musk and so many other corporate CEOs attacking anyone who criticizes the company also because tesla is a fraud and they do need to raise at least even a pro bullish tesla stock analyst said just admitted he just flipped on them and started criticizing the company and i'm sure elon's going to go after him that he said they need to raise three billion dollars in capital very quickly so there's a lot beneath the surface there's a lot of problems but in spite of this the stock market continues higher for a combination of factors including flight capital qe rate cuts etc but you know the i i think things things are just getting even more ridiculous it's i i'm tired of saying this but it's the reality of the situation we're in because we're in literally like the twilight zone or bizarro world or upside down world now Okay, guys, well, that's it for the short little show. I could take a look at a couple listener questions and comments, but I'm going to try to get out of here pretty quickly. I don't have a lot of time. Watchmen, it's not Saturday for me, but happy Saturday to you. Uh, you're in Europe, right? Ramaral Gudapati says, Jason, where do you see oil prices? And I think they could. I think they're trying to keep oil prices at these levels here to bring on more production to offset any production that's lost from Iran from the embargoes and bans. The problem is that the shale companies have to spend enormous amounts of capex, and the investors into shale do not trust a lot of the CEOs in shale anymore. I hear there are massive amounts of shareholder lawsuits 
for a lot of these smaller and medium-sized shale oil companies because they have been promising free cash flow, dividends, profitability every year for 10 or 11 years, and they have delivered none of it. So, but I think with that being said, at a higher oil price, which is we, we've rallied over 20% in just the last couple months at the, these higher oil prices, this could delay bankruptcy for a lot of these shale oil companies. On top of that, you could see some of these major, larger, super major oil companies come in and start doing mergers and acquisitions and buying assets because a lot of the oil stocks up until the last like four to six months have not done well. There was some charts showing how badly oil company stocks have been doing the last 10 to 12 years, despite oil price, even when oil prices rise, that the oil companies normally don't benefit very much from that. And I think a lot of this has to do with gross mismanagement. The oil company CEOs, like the, the deal that went, I encourage you, I'll attach a link to read the article about the corruption and white collar crimes allegedly from the Anadarko Petroleum CEO and the executives there screwing over shareholders. But I think this happened to me in 2013 with a smaller oil company because I was running the numbers on the assets and the cash flow, and the company sold for way lower than I thought it should. And I think management cashed out and got a big, big payoff in stock options and tax benefits, similar to what Anadarko just tried to do. And the shareholders in this buyout, because I thought the company had a lot of good growth ahead of it. They had a lot of earnings, production growth, earnings growth, free cash flow growth. And the CEO, the management team accepted a buyout offer and sold out the company for way too cheap, in my opinion. So if it happened then five or six years ago, it's been happening for a while now. But congratulations to the Wall Street Journal reporters who are actually doing a good job with this piece of investigative journalism. Joseph says Hong Kong's banking system is 900 to 1 leveraged. That does not surprise me because China China has been using that as a money laundering capital and buying real estate and stuff like that there. And now they've been moving to avoid tariffs. Chinese companies move their goods from mainland China to Hong Kong. And then because the uh, Kyle Bass explains this in the Hedge Eye interview uh, that was released yesterday, that once it's moved to Hong Kong, Chinese companies then US has a has a trade agreement with Hong Kong with no tariffs. So it sounds like that's going to be changing soon. That the Chinese companies have figured a way around that and um that loophole that they figured out is going to be closed soon. And basically it sounds like Trump if he I don't condone anyone using tariffs but we don't have free trade cuz everyone tries to either put tariffs on imports or manipulate their currency exchange rate favorably. But it sounds like Trump has the Chinese over a barrel now if he wanted to raise tariffs. That's what Kyle Bass is saying and Steve Bannon is saying. And there's interesting arguments about why. Uh, there's a new CNBC interview. It's in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group. If you want to take a look, it was released. It's like 13 minutes long. It was released. There's Kyle Bass, Steve Bannon, and the guy interviewing them about what... And Kyle Bass also did... wrote a... Uh, op-ed article in Bloomberg, I think in February, about what he thinks that Trump should do with the China-US trade deal. Uh, I don't know the exact date for when QE4 is coming. It sounds like, based on the comments from the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the rate cuts are coming first. So I would pay attention to that. We could get the rate cuts pretty soon, probably in a couple months. That's what it looks like. Okay, there's a couple people commenting on Avengers. Uh, no spoilers. Someone said Thor got fat. Well, it did show him in the com TV commercials eating rolls. So carbs and beer are probably not a good mixture of things. Okay, guys. Well, that's it for today's show. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If I forgot anything, I'll let you guys know. But we live in very interesting times, don't we? Where we the, the old money managers that used to be able to predict how things would based on fundamentals and economic data and earnings reports from companies, they're getting screwed over, they're underperforming, they're getting things totally wrong. So, Kip, Kip, I agree with you on that before we let things go. That is exactly Trump. Trump offered the Democrats a way better deal for the Dreamers and the Democrats turned it down because that would have been a win for the Trump 
uh, for Trump prior, and the Democrats wanted to run on that in the 2018 congressional elections. So he offered them a really good deal for the Dreamers, and they turned it down. So the the Democrats, I think, I think they want to destroy the country. I think they want to accelerate it. They want to turn the U.S. into exactly what the U.K. is and the European Union. You hear Bernie Sanders anytime, like Bernie saying how felons should be able to vote. And every time people argue with Bernie Sanders, he says, well, all these European countries, Sweden does it, Finland does it, you know, all these European countries do it, so we need to, we need to do it. That's Bernie's argument, Bernie Sanders' argument for everything. And before I wrap up, Bernie Sanders' economic advisor, this Stephanie Kelton lady, if you want to laugh, you got to look at the stuff on her Twitter, the stuff she's putting out about how the U.S. can just print unlimited dollars. Because if the U.S. does that, the the U.S. can, this is all theory, right? So the purchasing power of the dollar would diminish a lot, whether or not the government economic data propaganda for inflation statistics would say that or not. And the other part is if the U.S. goes to MMT and prints unlimited dollars, are the foreigners going to still take the dollar? So are they going to say, no, you're printing way too much. We don't want your dollars anymore. So these these academics, people like Stephanie Kelton, they're making a high salary. They're not getting paid to implement their policy in real life unless, unless Bernie Sanders wins the election. I mean, she would never get hired to implement that type of business strategy in any business. They're making really high salary. They have very bad theories. Their theories do not work in real life. Okay, well, that's it for today's show. I don't want to be here too long. I got a baseball game to watch, and I got to get ready for the Avengers movie. Everyone have a nice weekend. Okay, bye.